So here we are. Hi. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Good evening and welcome. So um, here we are once again. And finally, at uh, the highly expected second last class, you know, tomorrow is basically the wrap up for this for these lessons. And um, yeah, for this evening, what are we going to be doing? Well, last night we wrapped it up with antonyms. We ended, you know, the topic, like the whole thing of uh, um, talking about antonyms. For tonight, we are going to be trying to find some new antonyms because, um, you know, as I said yesterday, they are very abundant. There are tons and tons of words that work in that way in basically all languages. So tonight, we are going to be trying to find more antonyms. Apart from that, we are also going to be working on um, what we call phrasal verbs, which are, you know, verbs, common verbs that are built up by two words, a verb and a preposition. So those are, you know, very key things when it comes to learning English. This time I have to be specific because this is not something that, you know, all languages have. Of course, when there are features that most languages have, you know, I go ahead and tell you like that is a common feature of like every language. But phrasal verbs, the same as gerunds, are features that are not common in all languages. Phrasal verbs can be seen in other languages, I'm not going to lie, but uh, it's not something that you're going to find, you know, everywhere or every time you are learning a new language. Um, so that's like a complementary topic that we're going to be covering for this evening. Um, and we are also going to be talking about idioms. If you guys don't know, idioms are phrases that we use on our, not on a daily basis, but maybe on, you know, our daily lives, like with situations that are common or sometimes unexpected. They are very similar to the ones that we refer to as refranes or dichos in Spanish. And um, yeah, of course, they come very handy when it comes to understand um, like conversations or speech. You know, when people are having a conversation and you hear, for example, um, somebody say, another one bites the dust and you're like, what? Like, what does that mean? You know, I know that there might be someone here who actually got, you know, the reference, another one bites the dust um, from a song. But the meaning behind that phrase can be that, you know, someone else has made a mistake. Someone else has failed on completing a task. So that's what we are going to refer to when we use a phrase similar to that, you know, similar to another one bites the dust. Or another one that I like to use a lot is stop beating around the bush. That is another very common idiom that people use in English. And, uh, you know, if you take it like literally the phrase um, word by word, of course, it's going to mean that you're like kicking uh, a bush, kicking, you know, a plant. But in this case, what we are going to refer to stop beating around the bush is um, something that I do. I often do that when I'm like over explaining some things. So I go beating around the bush, which basically means, you know, that I am like um, giving too many details and details that may be seen as unnecessary details. So those are like, you know, the main things, the main ideas that we're going to be following for this evening. Of course, there is always the first practice. There is always the first part of the lesson, um, which is talking about the question for tonight. And tonight, um, I actually was thinking on, you know, doing a little bit of a, what can we call it? Maybe of a self-analysis to some extent. I know it's weird. It might be weird, but I want to know from mother nature, from like, you know, nature in general, Let's talk about animals, but not only talking about animals. I want to hear, or I want to get to know, what animal do you think that represents you the best? You know, like there are tons and tons of animals out there. And I want you to think, you know, to like picture yourself on an animal and which one represents you the best. So in my case, probably I would say that one animal that represents me is beaver, but not just in beaver. It's a beaver, okay? Uh, the ones that, that have like long teeth. So yeah, um, beavers. The reason why, well, they 
look that like they are lazy. In my case, I sometimes look like I am. And sometimes maybe I am. And I say that I just look like I am just to cover up that I, that I am. Uh, the thing is, uh, they may look like, you know, they are lazy, but they are most of the time working towards a goal. They have an objective and they have an idea, you know, of what they're going to do. In the case of beavers, normally it's dams, you know, not the bad word, but, you know, the real thing, a dam. So they normally uh, build dams, which are basically to create ponds for their family, ponds for even for themselves, just to swing around. Um, so yeah, beavers, you know, are probably not the hardest workers out there, not the, the animals that spend the most time working for uh, food or anything, but, you know, they seem kind of laid back and relaxed, but, you know, they have an idea of what they want to do. Um, so yeah, that's why I would say that in my case, I feel like I'm represented by a beaver. If you ask me about my favorite animal, in that case, it will have to be an eagle. The reason why? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I just know that I love the way, you know, they look. I love the way um, in which they they uh, um, hunt. Yeah, when they are like hunting for prey. And it's also probably because, well, I love the, nation, the, the, the team from here, from San Miguel, which is also represented by an eagle. So maybe those are my, uh, my reasons why that's my favorite animal. But this evening is not about your favorite it's about the one you feel most represented by so um i think we're gonna start maybe by hearing from rodrigo i feel like you know maybe you have um some sort of idea what animal do you think represents you the best so rodrigo in your case what would be your answer oh sorry in this case rodrigo mendoza rodrigo mendoza my bad okay teacher uh, good evening evening uh, in my case, I think uh, it's a tiger uh, because fast, because <laughs> fast, club deportivo fast, <laughs> and um, because I think it's animal very strong mm -hmm. and in the life uh, is necessary to be, be strong. strong in, in different situations, uh, not only physical and mental for example um and i love the the fine lines felino no sé si se pronuncia así. Mm -hmm. uh, i like the the fine lines animals too uh, for this uh, reason i think the tiger is my favorite animal and i think that is is strong and is um and, and is representative for me because of us. Okay, cool. Yes, us. <laughs> <laughs> Great. No, I mean, I have heard that there are many types of tigers out there. So do you have a specific kind or it's just like tigers in general? Because another thing that in my, uh, from my perspective, I have noticed about tigers. I don't know if this also, you know, represents you. Is that they are pretty elegant, you know, even when they're hunting, like they walk in such a smooth way that they look so wonderful, you know, on, on, on top of rocks, trees or anything. So, yeah, tigers are that kind of animal. They are very representative and very, very um, elegant from my perspective. So, yeah, uh, probably, you know, that also represents you. But do you have a specific like when you talk about tigers, is there a specific kind of tiger that you feel like represents you the best? Rodrigo? Um, I'm sorry, teacher. <clears throat> uh, yes, the tiger, and because for this reason, because it's, I consider it's, it's strong. And the, the second option is uh, the lion, for example, because it's similar to tiger. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. Okay, great, 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 great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, how about in the case of Raul? How about you, Raúl? Um, what would happen to be an animal that you feel like represents you, like the person you are? Mm, in my case, I consider that the the animal uh, that uh, that can rep represent me, uh, I think that the penguin, because mm -hmm. I consider that the penguin is an animal uh, quite. Is a, an animal that la, uh, is an animal that uh, that um, likes to 
eat a lot, but okay. But I know that uh, the penguin uh, lives in Antarctic, Antarctic. Mm -hmm. But I know that it's a good um, it's a it's a good place. But the penguin uh, uh, it doesn't get complicated because I I have uh, watching a documental about the penguin and the penguin no. Uh, uh, the penguin doesn't uh, wor uh, worry, and and the penguin uh, lives uh, quiet. And I and in my case, I am quiet with uh, in my in my job or in my house. And I consider that uh, I uh, I I I can be a penguin. I don't know. Okay, procedo a reproducir videos de pingüinos haciendo ruido. No, just, just kidding. Okay, so yeah, I mean, um, yeah, penguins, they seem to be, you know, quiet and very relaxed animals. Uh, another thing that I love about penguins is the way they care about, like, family. You know, it's not like, like they are toretos, but, you know, they do care about the family. Like they, um, like the whole, like the couple, when they have an egg or an offspring, um, they both take care of it. So that's something great, you know, something that I would love to see more like in, in, in human families, um, taking care of both at the same time or even the man having a little bit more of a um, a key role, you know, on, on the on the growing of this uh, offspring. But uh, yeah, penguins are, are great. And uh, um, I don't know, I, I there's one detail that I was thinking that I was going to share with you as well. Most penguins, just so you know, most penguins don't necessarily live in the Antarctica. Most of them actually live in New Zealand. They, um, you know, they like like temperate climates, not necessarily cold, like extreme cold. They say that from all these pieces of penguins that exist, around five are the ones that actually live in Antarctica. The rest of them, they all live in New Zealand or, you know, probably places around New Zealand. There's an archipelago that has most of the penguins in the world, and it is not necessarily, you know, freezing cold. And also, of course, there are many species, or I think it's like five species of penguins that live in um, Galapagos, which is also, you know, a little bit hot to some extent. So, yeah, it's not like all penguins, you know, only live in, in cold weather. Um, but yeah, it's an idea that we have. Normally we see that penguins live in cold weather, but it is cold compared to the tropical area, but it's not as cold as if it was always in the Antarctica. But still, it's, you know, just that detail, a random detail that I know about penguins. Um, but yeah, penguins are great, great animals. So pretty cool. Thank you very much, Raul. Um, how about now okay. we hear from, thank you. How about now we hear from Rodrigo Hernandez? In your case, Rodrigo, what animal do you feel most represented by when it comes, you know, to talking about um, the animal kingdom, like Mother Nature in general? Oh, hello, people. Uh, I have a thing about that uh, animal. Uh, it's a thing, but uh, I like the, the wolf. I, I think the is an uh, animal that uh, had a uh, special form of life. Uh, they had a code in the way of life. Mm -hmm. They are very organized and intelligent in the way of life. Okay. So I think uh, I like to. Uh, um, when this animal, when this animal uh, life in the in the wild, in the wild. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, wolves. They are pretty interesting. You know, um, I have heard that they like to work with other like packs of wolves, and that's also where the word pack actually works a lot. Um, so yeah, wolves are very very interesting dangerous to humans yes but for the same species they are also very protective they um take good care of like their packs you know when there's like wolves living around um they're kind of divisional like they prefer to live in different parts like 
unpack apart from another, but still, they are animals that do care for one another. They live in conditions that are very hard sometimes. Like for example, the wolves that live up north in like um the northern parts of like Canada, um, they have to do a lot of snow survival or or ice survival. Uh, but yeah, wolves, pretty interesting. That's a pretty interesting and also very strong animal to you know to to feel represented by. Now. How about in the case of Karen? How about you, Karen? What is the animal that you feel uh, that represents you um, the best? Um, hello, guys. So I don't think that represent me um, like 100%, but I love them. And probably, yes, I have some similar things. And it is uh, cats. I love cats. Uh, more than my dog okay and um it's because well cats do what they want to do and even if uh, they are domestic pets uh, yeah they live in your house and you feed them but they don't obey you so mm -hmm. they they didn't do what you want even if you call them they just um probably probably if they want just see you or probably not so and um yeah probably that's why i love cats and it's because yeah and and besides that i think that i'm not a loving person like cats mm, okay so they they are not they don't want to show they don't want they don't show love mm -hmm. so um, i kind of similar it's not because i don't love my family and uh, it's just because i'm not so expressive mm -hmm. you're not one of no. those warm people that is always going to be no. cheerful about like hugging or like telling people how no, much no, you no. love them no okay i i hug my son of course but uh, uh besides my son no, even with my friends, and I love them, but and they know that, but I'm not that kind that kind of person. Okay. So probably, yeah, I'm kind of like a cat. Okay, great. Yeah, I I dig with cats. I mean, cats <laughs> are my cup of tea. If I have to be honest, um, there is one word that I use all the time that for me represents everything in a cat, and it's independent. Yeah, you know they don't rely on you, and mm -hmm. they don't rely on on each other. Like when they have cats around them, it they they just don't care. It's like like yeah. I mean they have like their own way of survival, um, and they also have their own way of like going around things or going about things. Um, I do feel like, for example, dogs are as you said are they are the contrary. They are very uh needy in my in my opinion. They are very needy. Yeah. They need you to do everything for them. Like they need you to mm -hmm. pick up about them. They need you to clean everything for them. They need you to feed them all the time. However, cats are more independent in that way. Um, for example, something that I always say, and I have tried this before. Um, if you have those two pets, you have a dog and a cat, and you go on vacation. Um, and if you leave food for your dog, you know, just just just, just a bowl, a big big bowl of food. The dog is going to be, and I'm sorry for the word, but the dog is going to be as stupid that is going to eat it on the same day. In the next two, three days, it's going to be starving. The cat, however, that, that's something that I have tried. The cat is going to eat as much as it needs and leave the rest. Then it's going to come back to continue eating when it feels, you know, the need. Um, so that's something I love about him because they're not like, you know, dumb as dogs. And mm -hmm. as you said, you know, they do as they want. Like sometimes you may be calling it like, and they're not going to listen to you. They, just, <laughs> they don't want to. They don't want to. However, yeah. with dogs, it's like, you know, as soon as you call them, probably when they're like, you know, like angry, maybe when they're like, you know, in, in the in the like beef mode, probably then they're not going to listen. But most of the time they do. And most of the time they're yeah. pretty obedient and cats are yeah, not. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's a, it's a it's a big difference. You know, cats are mm -hmm. much more independent and where dogs are much more obedient and, and needy. Yeah. And, yeah, it's not that I don't like dogs. I do. But um, in my case, I would so much prefer to have a cat and a dog. I will, I do have 
you know. Yeah, uh, and I um, think if you live alone, a pet, a dog, and a cat, probably the dog won't um eat because he is going to be depressed, waiting for the master. That's only so, that happens. And the today. cat is like, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna eat whatever I want. That's, so yeah, today I was something watching. That I, uh, uh -huh. Sorry. Yeah. No, my bad. Continue. Okay. Today I was watching a video like one hour ago, and it was regarding cats. That it says that cats uh, are coming from other planets. That probably aliens mm -hmm. taken to the earth, and they are watching us. Through cats. So <laughs> yes, I was laughing with my mother. And, and talking about my cat, one of my cats, and he says, "Okay, you are watching me, and what are you, um, what are you going to say about me?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. There, there no. was something strange, but um, yeah, but it was great, great video. I think I have seen that video before. I think it kind of rings a bell. Um, but yeah, now that you say that about dogs not eating and getting depressed, I actually experienced that today. Mm. Um. I have been taking care or like, you know, half and half taking care of my girlfriend's dogs. And um, yeah, earlier today, well, they haven't been around because um, like, you know, my girlfriend's mom, she has been at the hospital for the last few days. So both of them, my um, brother-in-law and her have been staying with her at the hospital. So I'm basically the only person that they have been seeing. And they kind of did that today, like earlier today. The rest, the last two days, they have been eating, you know, like like regular. They go crazy about food and everything. But this morning, I mean, I didn't feed them since yesterday around... Oh, wait, no. They were not fed since yesterday around 5.30. So I went like around 10 a.m. today. So they were supposed to be very, very hungry. Hungry. Um, but they did not eat. They were eating like so slow, like, oh, my God, I don't want to mm -hmm. be here. They look so depressed and I, I got scared because, well, I'm taking care of them. So it's, if anything happens to them, you know, it's going to be on it's me. It's going to be you. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be on me. So I was like, mm -hmm. come on, eat. If you don't eat, I'm going <laughs> to eat it. No, just kidding. But <laughs> thing is, that, yeah, they were, they were just looking, you know, sad and depressed. And now in the afternoon, my girlfriend came with me to her house, you know, and we were feeding her dogs. And now they ate as regular you know they went crazy mm -hmm. about food they went crazy about eating so yeah it's it's a big like dependence that they have mm -hmm. so it's it's yeah. it's it's cute though i mean it's cute but uh for their own well-being it is not ideal but it is yeah. cute yeah we mm -hmm. have to be honest and yeah it, it is very cute but yeah well um so now that i know that you guys compared yourselves to animals I am going to continue with the rest of the topic for this evening. As I said, we're going to be talking about phrasal verbs, which are, as um, previously stated, verbs that are basically built up um, from one verb and a preposition. What happens here is that in English, um, contrary to what happens in Spanish, when they don't have a word for a specific action, what they do is that normally they simply create a phrase for verb. It's easier because you're simply mixing two words that already exist in your language and you're using them to express a different action. In Spanish, what we normally do when we don't have a word for something is that we create another one. So if you guys have, have ever studied anything about languages apart from you know just learning a language, um, Spanish has been known for that for decades. Spanish has been doing this. You know, Spanish is growing and growing and growing exponentially. Every word that happens to exist or every word that people start to use, um, the Real Academy of the Spanish language is simply adopting more and more and more words. And of course, adopting one word or one action, to be more specific, adopting one action is, of course, going to be represented by up to seven different words because Spanish if it's a verb, it has seven or more variations of the same. So that means that, you know, it's going to be huge, the amount of words you're going to add only by adding one action. In English, however, they do this. They go the easier route and they simply take one word and mix it with another. And then, boom, you have another one. And basically, that's all they do. You know, they don't really 
um, spend too much time thinking about it. They simply use words that already exist and mix them up, and then they have a new action. Now, um, here we have it. It doesn't mean, of course, I'm not saying that English is perfect and that it doesn't add new words. It does. It does from time to time. But it's not the, the first uh, option that they have. The first option is going to go this route, getting a phrasal verb. So, for example, um, some of the most common phrasal verbs that we have are, for example, referred to this. Okay. Um, what does this mean, for example? What do you guys know about this? ¿Qué significa esto, según ustedes? ¿Qué creen que significa esa palabra que les acabo de mostrar acá? Bueno, este eh, verbo fracial. Hmm. Puede ser maquillarse. Ok, yes, there we go. Make up, yeah. Make up means uh, normally maquillar, ¿verdad? When you apply some makeup over something. So this one is used as a noun and as a verb. Ok, so it's used for those. However, it can also be used as a three-word phrasal verb, ¿sí? Puede ser utilizado como un phrasal verb de tres palabras, porque también existen esos. Y sería en el caso del make up for. Y aquí cambia completamente el significado. No va a ser maquillarse para. No significa maquillarse para. Make up for is going to be used to refer to, eh, básicamente, suplir, ¿sí? Como reemplazar algo. Si yo, por ejemplo, me equivoqué con algo, cometí un error, arruiné algo. Um, let's say that, I don't know, somebody had a surprise gift for someone else, right? So there was like that gift and we were like all together, you know. Pro let's say that it's a group of friends, right? And one person had a surprise gift for the other. Um, and because of the emotion of the moment, because I just let go in that moment, I ended up ruining the surprise. I ended up, you know, Telling the other person like, oh yeah, this person has a surprise for you. Like show him. And, you know, I basically ruined the thing. So now what we are supposed to do or what we should do. Thank you. Thank you very much. What we should do is, or what someone would do to make up for something is to probably get another gift or do something, you know, to make this person feel better. So as, yes, as Jared shared with me through chat, it's basically like saying recompensar or recuperar. So making up for is not going to mean maquillarse para. It's going to mean, you know, um, doing something just to to like repair your wrong or um, better up your wrong. So that's, you know, the way in which we are going to be understanding uh, these phrasal verbs. Um, so, yeah. Now, we have the first one, go off, okay? To go off, it doesn't necessarily mean to go and turn off. It's going to mean um, to begin to sound. So, going off is normally used for alarms. Um, it can also be used for bombs, okay? It can also be used for things that simply activate all of a sudden. Um, but the, the main, main, main way in which we're going to use go off is with alarms. When an alarm starts sounding or begins to sound, that means that it went off. Um, we can use it. We can use it for devices, like if something runs out of battery, but that is like least common. That is probably more um, common to hear from a Latino than you know a, a, a native speaker of the language. Because, uh, yeah, what they do normally say is that it ran out of battery, got out of battery, instead of saying it went off. Because go off is basically to activate something. So go off basically will mean something like activating something. All right. So we have the example. From the time my alarm clock goes off, I am beginning my workout. Right. So that means that, you know, since it sounds, since it sounds, I am starting to go to do my, my workout. Now we have second one. It is wake up. Or here we're going to see when you can also mention someone or something in the middle, in between the two words. There are some phrasal verbs that can be divided. Um, however, there are some that cannot. For example, go off. Those two words have to be right next to one another for them to mean, you know, what they are expected to mean as a phrasal verb. 
However, when you say something like wake, then let's say uh, wake Leonardo up. That is still going to mean that Leonardo is emerging or causing someone to emerge from sleep. Now, there is also a huge difference that exists between waking up and getting up because people sometimes confuse both of them. Waking up is the act of coming out of your sleep. You know, it doesn't mean that that's exactly when you leave your bed or get out of bed. That is what you do when you actually get up. Like, for example, I remember that the other day, um, Rodrigo Mendoza, he was saying that, you know, because of his job, normally on Sundays, when he has Sundays off, he is going to wake up and stay up, stay in bed until late, you know. Um, it means that, for example, you wake up and then you can fall asleep again, you can wake up again, and the, the, the circle simply goes on. But waking up is not, and is never going to be the same as getting up. Getting up is actually to rise or cause someone to rise from bed after sleeping. Now, this is a very narrow meaning for this phrasal verb because getting up can also refer to um, people in an audience. Like, like, for example, if we were in a classroom right now and I will ask you to get up, it will mean that you know you have to leave your seat and stand up. That, however, the, the one that I use is stand up is the most common one that, that people use when it comes to um, conferences or classes. It's more common, much more common than getting up. But getting up is still useful in those situations. So wake up simply, you know, opening your eyes or coming out of uh, this little um, period and getting up is actually moving, doing some action with your body to leave your bed. All right. So uh, with examples, I woke up at seven o'clock and she woke him up gently. So these are the examples. Here, of course, this him, you can replace it all the time by, let's say this. Uh, she walked Jorge up gently. She walked um, um, Leslie up gently. Any name, any noun you can place here can work or will work. Now we have get up, same thing. Examples. I got up feeling tired and disoriented. So this is, you know, uh, probably a feeling that we get sometimes when we have um, a restless night of sleep, you know, when we can not sleep well. So I got up feeling tired and just disoriented. Or we also have this other example. We got him up because we had to go to a friend's house. We got him up because we had to go to a friend's house. Okay, now we have put. And then when you see STH, it means something. Okay, SB means somebody, SCH means something. So here is when you put something on. So putting on is uh, going to be understood as place a garment, jewelry, or any other piece of clothing on part of one's body. So if, for example, um, you live in a country where there is like a, a extreme weather, and by extreme, I mean a very cold weather, uh, and you're wanting, you know, someone to take care of themselves and probably not getting a cold or getting sick at all, um, you may request them or advise them to put a hat on, you know, put a hat on. So that means, you know, that you are requesting or advising this person to cover up their head. So place this piece of garment over their head, put a hat on. Or let's say that, um, I don't know, your sister is going into a party and uh, she already got her dress on, she already got her shoes on, but she feels like the, the whole outfit is incomplete. So maybe now you can, you know, suggest, um, how about you put, um, I don't know, a bracelet on or a necklace on, you know, that may complete your outfit, that may you feel more secure about your outfit. So that is when we use put something on. Uh, here we have an example. I put on my watch and set off a little late. I put on my watch and set off a little late. All right. Esa fue mi parte. Y ahora en adelante vamos a ir con ustedes. Ustedes van a decir más o menos qué entienden por el phrasal verb. Sí. Qué significado tiene para ustedes el phrasal verb. Y luego, si ustedes lo atinan, pues lo dejamos así. Si no, le damos un poquito de refuerzo. So now, dress up. Dress up. Let's see. Um, 
Raul, what do you understand by dress up? What do you think dress up means? Mm, for example, when when I go to the formal uh, party and I and I use a, a formal cloth, I don't know. Okay, that sounds as a very good idea. Yeah, when you go to a party where you have like a dress code or you have to dress in a specific way and you comply with this request. So that is dressing up. Dressing up normally is going to be seen as wearing clothes that you don't necessarily wear on an everyday, on an everyday basis. Um, so for example, here the definition says, put on a smart or formal clothes. So for people who work, I don't know, for banking or as lawyers or, you know, those careers that require you to dress formally or dress smartly all the time, well, they are barely going to dress up when they go to one of these occasions. However, dress up can also be used when we are referring to things like Halloween. When you use a costume, something that you do not wear on an everyday basis, that is also going to be understood as dressing up. So dressing up is basically that, you know, wearing something that you do not necessarily wear every day. So yeah, that's what you do when you dress up. And the example is, I only dress up on special occasions like wedding or other celebrations. Very good. Now, tidy up, tidy up. What do you think tidy up means, um, Harit? What do you think about this phrase or verb, tidy up? Um, organizar o ordenar. Okay. Entiendo yo. Yeah. Tidy up basically means that, you know, bring something to order or arrange something in a nice way or neatly, as we would say. So, yes, tidy up. Um, now, as always, this is a phrasal verb that is supposed to mean only that, right? However, it can also be used to referring to uh, advising someone to, um, in some extent, like fix a part of their outfit. Let's say that um, you see someone who is wearing a shirt, you know, like the one I'm wearing right now. And maybe this person missed a button, missed to, to button up one of the buttons. Um, now you can tell this person, hey, um, tidy up your shirt. That means, you know, to like rearrange it, to like organize it in a different way or re-button it. Um, you can also do that or say that when someone is wearing a tie and the tie might be slightly to one of the sides, so you can tell them like, hey, tidy up your tie. And that would mean, you know, to like bring it to the middle, bring it to where it's supposed to be. So that's tidy up. Um, and yeah, the example, the children don't like tidying up their bedrooms, but they always do it. So this is in the first meeting when it, we use it um, to refer to, of, of, of course, as you said, organizing or you know, arranging something, fixing something in a specific way. Now, switch something on. Switch something on or switch on. Um, let's see. Mendoza, Rodrigo Mendoza. What do you think about switch something on? Uh, switch something on, uh, for example, in Spanish is similar to encender. Uh, for example, I switched on the lamp for example okay great yes so yeah we understand it as um you know similar to turning on switch on and turn on is basically the same thing so here we have synonyms as well because yeah switching on and turning on is basically the same yes sorry teacher mm -hmm. uh, and and switch off is similar to turn off mm -hmm. Switch off okay. and turn okay. off. Yeah, okay. they're Thank both. You. Yeah, they're both similar. Uh, now, um, we also have, or you know, sometimes some people use the turn on and turn off. Um, the differences between them is that um, wait, yeah, turn on and turn off. Yeah, switch and turn. The difference that exists between them is that switch is normally seen as a like. Mm, singular movement, you know, it's like a linear movement. Change? Sorry? It's like change? 
switch yeah switch but in like a in in a linear movement switch is in like up and down or from side to side that's when you do switching or by simply pressing so that's switching uh but turning is normally used or it was used and then people started using you know using it for everything turning was when you actually had to turn in a circular way so back in the day and i think we can still see them nowadays we have many um bulbs like light bulbs that could be switched by simply oh, could be turned by simply turning something like um como que le llamaban a esas calaveras creo sí las calaveras de los de los de los de los focos so you had to turn something turn a piece so you turn on the light um nowadays is not as common and the, the thing is that you know the word is sticked and people now are using the turn on the same way as switch on because switch as i said is more in a like a linear way and turn should be in a circular way but they are both basically the same thing nowadays now um the definition says a start the flow of operation of something by means of a tap switch or button and uh the example she switched on the tv um uh, to watch her favorite show so yeah that was um the example and definition that we had now take something off take something off what do you understand by this um Karen? Well, it's, it's the same. It's like the definition remove clothing is just take off um, my shoes, for example. When I'm coming from a, from my work, mm -hmm. I just take off my shoes first. So, um, yeah. Or probably my glasses or something like that. It's just okay. remove. Removing instead of uh you know getting on or putting on, this one is removing, Take taking off, off mm -hmm. remove clothing from one or another's body. Now, one difference is that if you take this away and you simply leave the take off part, you know, just just as that, um, because take and then a word in the middle and off. That's going to mean remove clothing or remove garment from you. But take off, just as it is right here, is going to mean when a plane leaves the airport. You know, it's take off. It, even the pronunciation is going to be a bit different um, because you're not going to say necessarily take off, but take off. You do use a little bit of a linking sound there to make it sound like as if it was only one word. But yeah, that's the take off when, you know, a plane leaves um the airport and it starts of course its journey so yeah this is a word that if you use it with both of the words together it's going to mean one thing and if you use it with a separation in the middle with another word or uh, a noun that represents a piece of clothing or something like that it's going to mean something completely different so this is one of those to be you know um looking after because yeah you, you have to be um careful when you use take off now uh so the definition as we said before it's remove clothing from one's or another's body and the example i took off my shoes and lay down on the sofa so very good moving on we have now warm up warm up or warm up some people simply say warm up but uh if you can uh, if, sorry if you want to use it you know um as as a singular one yeah you can say warm up but it depends on how you prefer to say it. You can say warm up or warm up. Um, so now, warm up. What do you think this means, Rodrigo Hernandez? Sorry? Calentamiento. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah, that's basically it. So yes, warm up. It's, you know, the beginning is probably like an exercise, a short exercise that you do before starting the real exercise. And that is why we use it 
in school to refer to like the introduction of a topic when we are about to start a new topic we use a warm up activity we want the students to um get in line with you know what we are going to be discussing in the next um in the next class or in the class that we are just getting started with um however we can also use warm up when it comes to talking about physical exertion or physical exercises so warm up can be used for both um occasions and yeah it's basically just a short exercise that you perform that will get you into the mood of the activity that you are about to begin so that is going to be warm up now um the definition that we have here says prepare for physical exertion or a performance by exercising or practicing gently beforehand so it's just that you know getting your um your body or your muscles up to the task or in the case of uh, school getting your brain ready for the coming tasks now we have the example i always warm up thoroughly before going out for a jog all right now we have work out work out um what do you understand by work out raul um, for example when i when i i am or Um, for example, uh, I like to do exercise a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. If you do physical exercises a lot, if you do a lot of um physical performances or, you know, physical work, that is what we are going to understand as workout. And as the definition says or states, Workout engage is basically engaging in vigorous physical exercise. So when you use the word vigorous, it means that you know it's something rigid, something tough, something hard to perform. So workout is engaging in vigorous physical exercise. Now, the example: John tries to work out three or four times a week at the local gym. That is one example that we have. Now, this. Once again, is one of those words that we can also use as or with a different meaning if we add something right here. So if you have to work something out, it basically means to solve something. See, work something out or work it out. No va a significar, verdad, ejercitarlo. Sino work something out, eso va a ser resolver algo. Sí, digamos que hay un problema en el trabajo y o sea su jefe les ha encargado a ustedes que lo hagan y ustedes le dicen jefe pero I don't know what to do like I don't find a solution for this so your boss is gonna tell you well work it out you know work, work your way out of it um, and that's basically saying solve it you know go ahead and solve it as if it was that easy okay then uh, we have let somebody in so let in is very easy this one i think i'm not going to call anyone to um to know to, to give us their idea because yeah let somebody in it basically means admit someone to a room building or area like when you permit someone the entrance on a specific region or, or 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 section that is when you let somebody in so it's very easy the reason why we use the word let though is because we are referring to a person in this case if you are that person um, who has a higher authority over the other person. Let's say that um, you are, I don't know, the, the, um, the teacher in a, in a school room and a student is, you know, asking to come in. You are going to let the student in because you have more authority than the student. So that, in that way, you're going to be letting the student in. And as we said before, that is the definition. I mean, someone to a room building or area. The example, we let in our lovely dog in the house every morning. We let our lovely dog in the house um, every morning. So that basically means that you give the permit, the allowance for this dog to get into the house in the morning. So it means that also you have a higher position than the dog 
or that you are able to make the decision whether or not the dog can come into the house. Now we have come in. Come in is another one that is very easy. Come in, enter a room, building, or other place. Please come in and sit down. So come in is simply when you invite someone to come. So let in is when you allow it. Come in is when you invite. Kind of um, are basically, to some extent, pushing this person to do the action or to perform the action. So let, allow, come in, invite. All right. Uh, now we have move over, move over, and uh, we also have oh my bad. Um, kick out, move over, kick out, drunk cup or drink cup, and pick up. So those are the ones here. Move over. What do you think about moving over, Karen? Uh, move over is like change something from one place to another place. Good idea. Great idea. Yeah. Move over is basically when you are, you know, as it says here in the definition, adjusting one's position to make room for someone else. This is, of course, in the case of um, you being in a crowd, you being in a crowded place where there is little space for people to sit and you're asking people to. Oh, so one thing, one difference. Move over can be used, once again, by people who have the authority. Okay, so in the case of a classroom or in the case of, um, I don't know, a conference where, you know, there are teachers and principals and everything, the ones who have the authority over the students are going to use this word, move over. Now, if you are not someone who has authority over the rest of the people, you can use this one, scoop over scoop over is like you know like make me some room scoop over is like asking for people to make you some room move over is uh, is basically telling people to move so yeah there's a, a big difference there you know scooping over or when you ask people to scoop over is like asking gently asking politely for them to make some room for you but move over is when you give you know some people the order like let's say you are the teacher you are at a conference you have been standing for a while and now you want to sit. So now you ask your students, hey, move over. I want to sit. So because you have authority over them. Uh, but for example, the driver in the bus, mm -hmm. when the when the bus is, is yeah, that will be move over, you know. Yeah, move over. Yes. Basically, that that's when you use the move over. Very good. That is a great example. Okay. Uh now kick out. Kick out. What do you understand by kicking out, um, Mendoza? Um, for example, teacher, I kick out uh, with my friend. Uh, um, okay, uh, kick out at my friends after fight. <laughs> mm. For example. Okay. Yeah, you got kicked out of your friend's house after a fight, or you kicked your friend out of your oh sorry your own house after a fight so yeah kicking out is basically that you know expelling or sending somebody out sending or asking somebody to leave or asking not of course in a polite way but asking in an uh, authoritarian way um so yes kick out is basically that just like you know send them out um as if for example when you get a red card while playing soccer then you are basically kicked out of the game so yeah, kick out, spill, or dismiss someone. They kick me out of the club after the fight. And here is example, very similar to the one you just presented. Um, so yes, after a fight, you can easily be kicked out of the place. And what that means is simply that, you know, they request you to leave. They make you leave that space. Now, how about drink up? Drink up. Um, what do we understand by drink up? Um, had it. Hello, had it. Oh, there we go. Hello. Uh, it means uh, drinking everything. Okay. Yes. Sounds great. Yeah, drinking. Um, let's say the rest. You know, drinking the rest of 
um, something that you had on your glass or something that you had on a bottle that you were consuming. So yes, drink up is basically, vaya, en inglés se dice más eso, ¿verdad? El drink up, drink up, drink up, drink up. Lo que en español sería un fondo, 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 fondo. So it's basically the same thing. Um, so yeah, it's when you are, you know, um, enthusiastic about someone finishing uh, the rest of a drink that they have it, as fast as possible. So yeah, drink up is quickly consume the rest of a drink. And now we have, she drank up what was left of her beer and left in a hurry. So the example is probably the best, you know, um, to the to the word. So yes, drink up is to consume something quickly. Uh, or sorry, not something, but a drink quickly. Now we have pick up. Pick up is normally going to be answer the phone. So pick up is, uh, the, the reason why is because phones in the past, if you guys have seen videos or have used them, because I don't know, maybe you have used them, they normally were like in a lay down position and you have to actually move them up and well, pick them up. So that's when the word pick up or the phrasal verb pick up started to be used to refer to simply answering the phone. Nowadays, of course, we don't have to like pick necessarily pick up something. We do, of course, if we have our phone, for example, on the table, we still have to pick it up and bring it to our um to our ear. But the idea is not necessarily that you have to like pick it up, you know. The idea is that you actually have to like tap or slide on the phone for the call to actually connect. So that's what you know refers to or is referred to as pick up. The idea of connecting the call, not necessarily the action of picking your phone and bringing it to your ear, because that is it's part of the process, yes, but it's not necessarily what we refer to um, when we say pick up. And we have an example. I kept calling her, but she wouldn't pick up, so I couldn't tell her the news. And there we have it. I kept calling her, but she wouldn't pick up, so I couldn't tell her the news. Great. Very good. And I think we're going to only see um, two more, maybe. So speak up when you request. This is more normally a request. When you request someone to speak up, it means that you need them to speak louder. Maybe they're being too soft. Maybe that you're not able to understand what they're saying because, you know, the way in which they're speaking is in a lower tone of voice. And you need them, you know, to 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 like um, bring their level of voice a little bit up so that you can hear them well. So that is uh, when you are going to be using the phrasal verb, speak up. Please speak up. And you're asking them, well, to raise their tone of voice. And here we have the example on the phone. Could you speak up, please? I can't hear you properly. Mm -hmm. So this is the idea. You know, I cannot understand what you're saying because you're speaking too softly. And now we have hang up. Hang up or hang up on. Ahí hay una diferencia entre hang up y hang up on. See, hang up simply means to finish a phone, a phone call or to finish a telephone call. That is hang up. However, hanging up on someone, it means that you're doing, you're doing the same action but you're doing it because you're angry, because you do not want to continue um, talking to this person. So hang up on is because you're not okay with the call and simply hang up is because, well, you're done. You have already talked about um, whatever topic it is that you needed to talk about. And now there's you know no need for you guys to continue the conversation. So you simply hang up the call and go about your days as regular. As we are about to do now, I am about to hang up on you because I got mad at you. No, I'm just kidding. So yeah, I'm I'm about to hang up, you know, this call because we are basically done with the class. Now, uh, so what I have to do now, guys, is basically thank you. Tomorrow, please remember, tomorrow we have the last class for this module. So please join in. I am sure that, you know, we can find more things that we can learn and interesting things, of course, that we can go ahead and share with the rest of us. Um, but for now, I only have to tell you, thank you. Thank you very much for all the hard work you have done thus far. And well, I hope I'll see you tomorrow again. And I also hope you guys have an amazing rest of your day. So 
Thank you very much, guys. And bye-bye. See you Thank tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. See ya.